Chapter Fifteen of The Well at the World's End, Book Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book Four, by William Morris. Chapter Fifteen: A Strange Meeting in the Wilderness. On the morrow betimes they got to the road again. The country at first, though it was scanty of tillage, was not unfurnished of sheep, being for the most part of swelling hills and downs well grassed, with here and there a deep cleft in them. They saw but few houses, and those small and poor. A few shepherds they fell in with, who were short of speech after the manner of such men, but deemed a greeting not wholly thrown away on such goodly folk as those wayfarers. So they rode till it was noon, and Richard talked more than his wont was, though his daily use it was to be of many words, nor did the sage spare speech. But Ursula spoke little, nor heeded much what the other said, and Ralph deemed that she was paler than of wont, and her brows were knitted as if she were somewhat anxious. As for him he was grave and calm, but of few words, and whiles when Richard was wordiest he looked on them steadily for a moment, whereat Richard changed countenance, and for a while stinted his speech, but not for long while Ralph looked about him, inwardly striving to gather together the ends of unhappy thoughts that floated about him, and to note the land he was passing through, if indeed he had verily seen it aforetime, elsewhere than in some evil dream. At last, when they stopped to bait by some scrubby bushes at the foot of a wide hillside, he took Richard apart, and said to him, Old friend, and whither go we? said Richard, As thou wottest to the burg of the four friths? Yea, said Ralph, but by what road? said Richard. Youngling, is not thine heart then as strong as thou deemst last night? Ralph was silent a while, and then he said, I know what thou wouldst say. We are going by the shortest road to the Castle of Abundance. He spake this out loud, but Richard nodded his head to him, as if he would say, Yea, so it is, but hold thy peace. But Ralph knew that Ursula had come up behind him, and, still looking at Richard, he put his open hand aback toward her, and her hand fell into it. Then he turned about to her, and saw that her face was verily pale, so he put his hands on her shoulders and kissed her kindly, and she let her head fall on to his bosom and fell a-weeping, and the two elders turned away to the horses, and feigned to be busy with them. Thus then they bided some minutes of time, and then all gat to horse again, and Ursula's face was cleared of the grief of fear, and the colour had come back to her cheeks and lips. But Ralph's face was stern and sorrowful to behold. Howbeit, as they rode away, he spake in a loud and seeming cheerful voice, Still ever shorteneth more and more the way unto my father's house, and withal I am wishful to see if it be indeed true that the men of the burg have become mild and peaceful, and to know what hath befallen those doughty champions of the dry tree and if perchance they have any will to hold us a tilting in courteous fashion. Richard smiled on him, and said, Thou holdest more, then, by the dry tree than by the burg, though while agone we deemed the champions worse men to meet in the wood than the burghers. So it is, said Ralph, but men are oft missaid by them that know them not thoroughly, and now, if it were a good wish, O sage of Swevenham, I were fain to fall in with the best of all those champions, a tall man and a proper, whom it seems had good will toward me, I know not why. Quoth the sage, If thou canst not see the end of this wish fulfilled, no more can I, and yet meseems something may follow it which is akin to grief. Be content with things so done, my son. Now Ralph holds his peace, and they speed on their way, Ursula riding close by Ralph's side, and caressing him with looks, and by touch also when she might and after a while he fell to talking again, and ever in the same loud, cheerful voice, till at last, in about another hour, they came in sight of the stream which ran down toward the swelling flood from that pool wherein erst the Lady of Abundance had bathed her before the murder. Hard looked Ralph on the stream, but howsoever his heart might ache with the memory of that past grief, like as the body aches with the bruise of yesterday's blow, yet he changed countenance but little and in his voice was the same cheery sound. But Ursula noted him, and how his eyes wandered, and how little he heeded the words of the others, and she knew what ailed him, for long ago he had told her all that tale, 
and so now her heart was troubled, and she looked on him, and was silent. Thus, then, a little before sunset, they came on that steep cliff with the cave therein, and the little green plain thereunder, and the rocky bank going down sheer into the water of the stream. Forsooth they came on it somewhat suddenly from out of the bushes of the valley, and there indeed not only the sage and Richard, but Ursula also, were stayed by the sight as folk compelled, for all three knew what had befallen there. But Ralph, though he looked over his shoulder at it all, yet rode on steadily, and when he saw that the others lingered, he waved his hand and cried out as he rode, On, friends, on, for the road shortens towards my father's house. Then were they ashamed, and shook their reins to hasten after him. But in that very nick of time there came forth one from amidst the bushes that edged the pool of the stream, and strode dripping on to the shallow. A man brown and hairy, and naked save for a green wreath about his middle. Tall he was above the stature of most men, awful of aspect, and his eyes glittered from his dark brown face amidst of his shockhead of the colour of rain-spoiled hay. He stood and looked while one might count five, and then without a word or cry rushed up from the water straight on Ursula, who was riding first of the three lingerers, and in the twinkling of an eye tore her from off her horse, and she was in his grasp as the cushat in the claws of the kite. Then he cast her to earth and stood over her, shaking a great club, but or ever he brought it down he turned his head over his shoulder toward the cliff and the cave therein, and in that same moment first one blade and then another flashed about him, and he fell crashing down upon his back smitten in the breast and the side by Richard and Ralph, and the wounds were deep and deadly. Ralph heeded him no more, but drew Ursula away from him, and raised her up and laid her head upon his knee. And she had not quite swooned away, and forsooth had taken but little hurt, only she was dizzy with terror, and the heaving up and casting down. She looked up into Ralph's face, and smiled on him, and said, What hath been done to me, and why did he do it? His eyes were still wild with fear and wrath as he answered, O oh, beloved death, and the foemen of old came forth from the cavern of the cliff. What did they there, Lord God? And he caught thee to slay thee, but him have I slain. Nevertheless it is a terrible and evil place. Let us go hence. Yea, she said, let us go speedily. Then she stood up, weak and tottering still, and Ralph arose and put his left arm about her to stay her. And lo, there before them was Richard kneeling over the wild man, and the sage was coming back from the river with his headpiece full of water, so Ralph cried out, To horse, Richard, to horse! Hast thou not done slaying the woodman? But therewith came a weak and hoarse voice from the earth, and the wild man spake, Child of Upmeads, drive not on so hard. It will not be long, for thou and Richard the Red are not light-handed. Ralph marvelled that the wild man knew him, and Richard, but the wild man spake again, Hearken, thou lover, thou young man! But therewith was the sage come to him, and kneeling beside him with the water, and he drank thereof, while Ralph said to him, What is this, woodman? And canst thou speak my Latin? What art thou? Then the wild man, when he had drunk, raised him up a little, and said, Young man, thou and Richard are deft leeches. Ye have let me blood to a purpose, and have brought back to me my wits, which were wandering wide. Yet am I indeed where my fool's brains told me I was. And he lay back again, and turned his head as well as he could toward the cavern in the cliff. But Ralph deemed he had heard his voice before, and his heart was softened toward him, he knew not why. But he said, Yea, but wherefore didst thou fall upon the lady? The wild man strove with his weakness, and said angrily, What did another woman there? Then he said, in a calmer but weaker voice, Nay, my wits shall wander no more from me. We will make the journey together, I and my wits. But, O oh, young man, this I will say if I can. Thou fleddest from her and forgattest her. I came to her and forgat all but her. Yea, my very life I forgot. Again he spoke, and his voice was weaker yet. Kneel down by me, or I may not tell thee what I would. My voice dieth before me. Then Ralph knelt down by him, for he began to have a deeming of what he was and he put his face close to the dying man's, and said to him, I am here, what wouldst thou? Said the wild man very feebly, I did not much for thee time was, and how might I when I loved her so sorely? But I did a little, 
believe it and do so much for me that i may lie by her side when i am dead who never lay by her living for into the cave i durst go never then ralph knew him that he was the tall champion whom he had first met at the churchyard gate of netherton so he said i know thee now and i will promise to do thy will herein i am sorry that i have slain thee forgive it me a mocking smile came into the dying man's eyes and he spake whispering richard it was not thou the smile spread over his face he strove to turn more toward ralph and said in a very faint whisper the last time no more he said but gave up the ghost presently the sage rose up from his side and said ye may now bury this man as he craved of thee for he is dead thus hath thy wish been accomplished for this was the great champion and duke of the men of the dry tree indeed it is a pity of him that he is dead for as terrible as he was to his foes he was no ill man spake richard now is the riddle arrayed of the wild man and the mighty giant that haunted these passes we have played together or now in days long past he and i and ever he came to his above he was a wise man and a prudent that he should have become a wild man it is a great pity of him but ralph took his knight's cloak of red scarlet and they lapped the wild man therein who had once been a champion beworshipped but first ursula sheared his hair and his beard till the face of him came back again grave and somewhat mocking as ralph remembered it time was then they bore him in the four corners across the stream and up on to the lawn before the cliff and richard and the sage bore him into the cave and laid him down there beside the howe which ralph had erewhile heaped over the lady and now over him also they heaped stones meanwhile ursula knelt at the mouth of the cave and wept but ralph turned him about and stood on the edge of the bank and looked over the ripple of the stream on to the valley where the moon was now beginning to cast shadows till those two came out of the cave for the last time then ralph turned to ursula and raised her up and kissed her and they went down all of them from that place of death and ill hap and gat a horse on the other side of the stream and rode three miles further on by the glimmer of the moon and lay down to rest amongst the bushes of the waste with few words spoken between them end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the well at the world's end book four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book Four, by William Morris. Chapter 16. They Come to the Castle of Abundance Once More. When they rode on next morning, Ralph was few spoken, and seemed to heed little so long as they made good speed on the way. Most of the talk was betwixt Richard and the sage, Ralph but putting in a word when it would have seemed churlish to forbear. So they went their ways to the wood, till by then the sun was well westering, they came out at the water of the oak, and Richard drew rein there, and spake, Here is a fair place for a summer night's lodging, and I would warrant both good knight and fair lady have lain here aforetime, and wished the dark longer. Shall we not rest here? Ralph stared at him astonished, and then anger grew in his face for a little, because forsooth, as Richard and the sage both watered at the place of the slaying of the lady, and he himself had every yard of the way in his mind as they went, it seemed but due that they should have known of this place also, what betid there. But it was not so, and the place was to Richard like any other lawn of the woodland. But thought came back to Ralph in a moment, and he smiled at his own folly, howbeit he could not do to lie another night on that lawn with other folk than erst. So he said quietly, Nay, friend, were we not better to make the most of this daylight? Seest thou at once yet an hour of sunset? Richard nodded a yeasay, and the sage said no word more, but Ursula cast her anxious look on Ralph as though she understood what was moving in him, and therewith those others rode away lightly, but Ralph turned slowly from the oak tree, and might not forbear looking on to the short sward round about, as if he hoped to see some token left behind. Then he lifted up his face as one awaking, shook his rein, and rode after the others down the long water. So they turned from the water anon, and rode the woodland ways, and lay that night by a stream that ran west. 
they arose betimes on the morrow and whereas the sage knew the woodland ways well they made but a short journey of it to the castle of abundance and came into the little plain but two hours after noon where saving that the scythe had not yet winded the tall mowing grass in the crofts which the beasts and sheep were not pasturing all was as on that other tide the folk were at work in their gardens or herding their cattle in the meads and as aforetime they were merry of countenance and well clad fair and gentle to look on there were their pleasant cots and the little white church and the fair walls of the castle on its low mound and the day bright and sunny all as aforetime and ralph looked on it all and made no countenance of being moved beyond his wont so they came out of the wood and rode to the ford of the river and the carles and queens came streaming from their garths and meads to meet them, and stood round wondering at them. But an old carl came from out the throng, and went up to Ralph, and hailed him, and said, O knight, and hast thou come back to us? And hast thou brought us tidings of our lady? Who is this fair woman that rideth with thee? Is it she? Spake Ralph, Nay, go look on her closely, and tell me thy deeming of her. So the carl went up to Ursula, and peered closely into her face, and took her hand and looked on it and knelt down and took her foot out of the stirrup and kissed it and then came back to ralph and said fair sir i wot not but it may be her sister for yonder old wise man i have seen here erst with our heavenly lady but though this fair woman may be her sister it is not she so tell me what is become of her for it is long since we have seen her and what thou tellest us that same shall we trow even as if thou wert her angel for i spake with thee it is nigh two years agone when thou wert abiding the coming of our lady in the castle yonder but now i see of thee that thou art brighter faced and mightier of aspect than aforetime and it is in my mind that the lady of abundance must have loved thee and holpen thee and blessed thee with some great blessing said ralph old man canst thou feel sorrow and canst thou bear it the carl shook his head i wot not said he i fear thy words said ralph it were not to say less than the truth and this is the very truth that thou shalt never see thy lady any more i was the last living man that ever saw her alive then he spake in a loud voice and said lament ye people for the lady of abundance is dead yet sure i am that she sendeth this message to you live in peace and love ye the works of the earth but when they heard him the old man covered up his face with the folds of his gown and all that folk break forth into weeping, and crying out, Woe for us! The Lady of Abundance is dead! And some of the younger men cast themselves down on to the earth, and wallowed, weeping and wailing. And there was no man there that seemed as if he knew which way to turn or what to do, and their faces were foolish with sorrow. Yet forsooth it was rather the carls and the queens who made all this lamentation. At last the old man spake, Fair sir, ye have brought us heavy tidings, that we know not how to ask you to tell us more of the tale yet if thou mightst but tell us how the lady died woe's me for the word said ralph she was slain with the sword the old man drew himself up stiff and stark the eyes of him glittered under his white hair and wrath changed his face and the other men folk thronged them to hearken what more should be said but the elders spake again tell me who it was that slew her for surely shall i slay him or die in the pain else said ralph be content thou mayst not slay him he was a great and mighty man a baron who bore a golden sun on a blue field thou mayst not slay him yea said the old man but i will or he me live in peace said ralph for i slew him then and there the old man held his peace a while and then he said i know the man for he hath been here aforetime and not so long ago but if he be dead he hath a brother yet an exceeding mighty man he will be coming here to vex us and diminish us said ralph he will not stir from where he lies till earth's bones be broken for my sword lay in his body yesterday the old man stood silent again and the other carls thronged him but the woman stood aloof staring on ralph then the elder came up to ralph and knelt before him and kissed his feet then he turned and called to him three of the others who were of the stoutest and most stalwart and he spake with him a while and then he came to ralph again and again knelt before him and said lord ye have come to us and found us void of comfort since we have lost our lady but we see in thee that she hath loved thee and blessed thee 
and thou hast slain her slayer and his kindred. And we see of thee also that thou art a good lord. O oh, the comfort to us, therefore, if thou wouldst be our lord. We will serve thee truly so far as we may. Yea, even if thou be beset by foes, we will take bow and bill from the wall, and stand round about thee and fight for thee. Only thou must not ask us to go hence from this place, for we know not but the plain of abundance, and the edges of the wood, and the brethren of the house of the thorn who are not far hence. Now we pray thee by thy fathers not to naysay us, so sore as thou hast made our hearts. Also we see about thy neck the same like pair of beads which our lady was wont to bear, and we deem that ye were in one tale together. Then was Ralph silent a while, but the sage spake to the elder, Old man, how great is the loss of the lady to you? Heavy loss, wise old man, said the carl, as thou thyself mayst know, having known her. And what did she for you, said the sage? Said the elder, We know that she was gracious to us. Never did she lay tax or tale on us, and while she would give us of her store, and that often and abundantly. We deem also that every time when she came to us our increase became more plenteous, which is well seen by this, that since she has ceased to come, the seasons have been niggered unto us. The sage smiled somewhat, and the old man went on. But chiefly the blessing was to see her when she came to us, for verily it seemed that where she set her feet the grass grew greener, and that the flowers blossomed fairer where the shadow of her body fell. And therewith the old man fell a-weeping again. The sage held his peace, and Ralph still kept silence, and now of these men all the younger ones had their eyes upon Ursula. After a while Ralph spake and said, O elder, and ye folk of the people of abundance, true it is that your lady who is dead loved me, and it is through her that I am become a friend of the well. Now meseemeth, though ye have lost your lady, whom ye so loved and worshipped, God wot not without cause. Yet I wot not why ye now cry out for a master, since ye dwell here in peace and quiet and all wealth, and the fathers of the thorn are here to do good to you. Yet if ye will it in sooth, I will be called your lord, in memory of your lady whom ye shall not see again. And as time wears, I will come and look on you, and hearken to your needs. And if ye come to fear that any should fall upon you with a strong hand, then send ye a message to me, Ralph of Upmeads, down by the water, and I will come to you with such following as need be. And as for service, this only I lay upon you, that ye look to the castle, and keep it in good order, and ward it against thieves and runagates, and give guesting therein to any wandering knight or pilgrim or honest goodman who shall come to you. Now is all said, my masters, and I pray you let us depart in peace, for time presses. Then all they, and this time women as well as men, cried out joyfully, Hail to our Lord, and long life to our helper. And the women withal drew nearer to him, and some came close up to him, as if they would touch him or kiss his hand, but by seeming durst not, but stood blushing before him and he looked on them, smiling kindly. But the old man laid his hand on his knee, and said, Lord, wouldst thou not light down and into thy castle? For none hath more right there now than thou. The prior of the thorn hath told us that there is no lineage of the lady left to claim it, and none other might ever have claimed it save the baron of Sunway whom thou hast slain, and else would we have slain him since he slew our lady. Ralph shook his head and said, Nay, old friend, a new vassal, this we may not do. We must on speedily, for belike there is work for us to do nearer home. Yea, lord, said the carl, but at least light down and sit for a while under this fair oak tree in the heat of the day, and eat a morsel with us and drink a cup, that thy luck may abide with us when thou art gone. Ralph would not nay say him, so he and all of them got off their horses and sat down on the green grass under the oak, and that people gathered about and sat down by them, save that a many of the women went to their houses to fetch out the victual. Meanwhile the carles fell to speech freely with the wayfarers, and told them much concerning their little land, were it hearsay or stark sooth, such as tales of the whites that dwelt in the wood, wood houses, and elf women, and dwarves, and such like, and how fearful it were to deal with such creatures. Amongst other matters they told how a hermit, a holy man, had come to dwell in the wood, in a clearing but a little way thence toward the northwest. But when Ralph asked if he dwelt on the way to the ford of the swelling flood, they knew not what he meant for the wood was to them as a wall. Hereon the sage held one of the younger men in talk, and taught him what he might of the way to the burg of the four friths, so that they might verily send a messenger to Upmeads if need were. But the country youth said there was no need to think thereof, 
as no man of theirs would dare the journey through the wood, and that if they had need of a messenger, one of the fathers of the thorn would do their errand, whereas they were holy men, and knew the face of the world full well. Now in this while the folk seemed to have gotten their courage again, and to be cheery, and to have lost their grief for the lady, and of the maidens left about the oak were more than two or three very fair, who stood gazing at Ralph as if they were exceeding fain of him. But amidst these things came back the women with the victual, to wit bread and baskets, and cheeses both fresh and old, and honey, and wood strawberries, and eggs cooked diversely, and skewers of white wood with gobbets of roasted lamb's flesh, and salad good plenty. All these they bore first to Ralph, and Ursula, and their two fellows, and then dealt them to their own folk, and they feasted, and were merry, in despite of that tale of evil tidings. They brought also bowls and pitchers of wine that was good and strong, and cider of their orchards, and called many a health to the new lord and his kindred. Thus then they abode a-feasting, till the sun was westering, and the shadows waxed about them. And then at last Ralph rose up, and called to horse, and the other wayfarers arose also, and the horses were led up to them. Then the maidens, made bold by the joy of the feast, and being stirred to the heart by much beholding of this beloved lord, cast off their shamefacedness, and crowded about him, and kissed his raiment and his hands. Some even, though trembling, and more for love than fear, prayed him for kisses. And he, nothing loath, laughed merrily, and laid his hands on their shoulders, or took them by the chins, and set his lips to the sweetness of their cheeks and their lips, of those that asked and those that refrained, so that their hearts failed them for love of him, and when he was gone they knew not how to go back to their houses or the places that were familiar to them. Therewith he and his got into their saddles and rode away slowly, because of the throng about them of that folk who followed them to the edge of the wood, and even entered a little thereinto, and then stood gazing on Ralph and his fellows after they had spurred on, and were riding down a glade of the woodland. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Well at the World's End, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 4, by William Morris. Chapter 17. They Fall In With That Hermit. So much had they tarried over this greeting and feasting, that though they had hoped to come to the hermit's house that night, he of whom that folk had told them, it fell not so, whereas the day had aged so much ere they left the plain of abundance, that it began to dusk before they had gone far, and they must needs stay and await the dawn there. So they dight their lodging as well as they might, and lay down and slept under the thick boughs. Ralph woke about sunrise, and looking up saw a man standing over him, and deemed at first that it would be Richard, or the sage, but as his vision cleared he saw that it was neither of them, but a newcomer, a stout carl clad in russet, with a great staff in his hand, and a short sword girt to his side. Ralph sprang up, still not utterly awake, and cried out, Who art thou, carl? The man laughed, and said, Yea, thou art still the same brisk lad, only filled out to something more warrior-like than of old but it is unmeet to forget old friends. Why dost thou not hail me? Because I know thee not, good fellow, said Ralph. But even as he spoke, he looked into the man's face again and cried out, By St. Nicholas! But it is Roger of the rope-walk. But look, you fellow, if I have somewhat filled out, thou who wast always black-muzzled, art now become as hairy as a wood-house. What dost thou in the wilds? Said Roger. Did they not tell thee of a hermit new come to these shaws? Yea, said Ralph. I am that holy man, quoth Roger, grinning, not that I am so much of that, either. I have not come hither to pray or fast over much, but to rest my soul and be out of the way of men, for all things have changed since my lady passed away. He looked about and saw Ursula just rising up from the ground and the sage stirring, while Richard yet hugged his bracken bed, snoring. So he said, And who be these, and why hast thou taken to the wild wood? Yea, lad, I see of thee that thou hast gotten another lady, and if mine eyes do not fail me, she is fair enough, but there be others as fair, while the like to our lady that was, there is none such. He fell silent a while, and Ralph turned about to the others, for by this time Richard also was awake, and said, This man is the hermit of whom we were told. Roger said, 
Yea, I am the hermit and the holy man, and withal I have a thing to hear and a thing to tell. You are best to come with me, all of you, to my house in the woods. A poor one, forsooth, but there is somewhat of victual here, and we can tell and hearken therein well sheltered and at peace. So to horse, fair folk. They would not be bidden twice, but mounted and went along with him, who led them by a thicket path about a mile, till they came to a lawn where through ran a stream, and there was a little house in it, simple enough, of one hall, built with rough tree limbs and reed thatch. He brought them in, and bade them sit on such stools or bundles of stuff as were there. But withal he brought out victual nowise ill, though it were but simple also, of venison of the wildwood, with some little deal of cakes baked on the hearth and he poured for them also both milk and wine. They were well content with the banquet, and when they were full, Roger said, Now, my lord, like as oft befalleth minstrels, ye have had your wages before your work. Fall to, then, and pay me the scot by telling me all that hath befallen you since, woe worth the while, my lady died. I must needs say for thy sake. All is a big word, said Ralph, but I will tell thee somewhat. Yet I bid thee take note that I and this ancient wise one, and my lady withal, deem that i am drawn by my kindred to come to their help and that time presses roger scowled somewhat on ursula but he said lord and master let not that fly trouble thy lip for so i deem of it that whatsoever time ye may lose by falling in with me ye may gain twice as much by hearkening my tale and the reed that shall go with it and i do thee to wit that the telling of thy tale shall unfreeze mine so tarry not if ye be in haste to be gone but let thy tongue wag Ralph smiled, and without more ado told him all that had befallen him, and of Swevenham and Utterbol, and of his captivity and flight, and of the meeting in the wood, and of the sage who there was, and of the journey to the well, and what betid there and since, and of the death of the champion of the dry tree. But when he had made an end, Roger said, There it is then, as I said when she first spake to me of thee, and bade me bring about that meeting with her, drawing thee first to the burg, and after to the castle of abundance, I have forgotten mostly by what lies. But I said to her that she had set her heart on a man over lucky, and that thou wouldst take her luck from her and make it thine. But now I will let all that pass, and will bid thee ask what thou wilt. And I promise thee that I will help thee to come thy ways to thy kindred, that thou mayst put forth thy luck in their behalf. Said Ralph, First of all tell me what shall I do to pass unhindered through the burg of the four friths? said roger thou shalt go in at one gate and out at the other and none shall hinder thee said ralph and shall i have any hindrance from them at the dry tree roger made as if he were swallowing down something and answered nay none and the folk of higham by the way and the brethren and their abbot said ralph i know but little of them quoth roger but i deem that they will make a push to have thee for captain because they have had war on their hands of late but this shall be at thine own will to say yea or nay to them. But for the rest on this side of the shepherd's country, ye will pass by peaceful folk. Yea, said Ralph, what then hath become of the pride and cruelty of the burg of the four friths, and the eagerness and fierceness of the dry tree? Quoth Roger, this is the tale of it. After the champions of the dry tree had lost their queen and beloved, the Lady of Abundance, they were both restless and fierce, for the days of sorrow hung heavy on their hands. So on a time a great company of them had to do with the burghers, somewhat recklessly, and came to the worse, wherefore some drew back into their fastness of the scour, and the others still rode on, and further west than their wont had been. But warily when they had the wood perilous behind them, for they had learned wisdom again. Thus riding they had tidings of an host of the burg of the four friths who were resting in a valley hard by with a great train of captives and beasts and other spoil for they had been raising the fray against the wheat-wearers, and had slain many carles there, and were bringing home to the burg many young women and women-children after their custom. So they of the dry tree advised them of these tidings, and deemed that it would ease the sorrow of their hearts for their lady, if they could deal with these sons of whores and make a mark upon the burg. So they lay hid while the daylight lasted, and by night and cloud fell upon these fainants of the burg, and won them good cheap as was like to be, though the burg dwellers were many the more whereof a many were slain but many escaped and got home to the burg even as will likely happen even in the worst of overthrows that not all or even the more part be slain well there were the champions and their prey which was very great and especially of women of whom the more part were young and fair for the women of the wheat-wearers be goodly 
and these had been picked out by the rutters of the burg for their youth and strength and beauty. And whereas the men of the dry tree were scant of women at home, and sore-hearted because of Our Lady, they forbore not these women, but fell to talking with them and loving them, albeit in courteous and manly fashion, so that the women deemed themselves in heaven, and were ready to do anything to please their lovers. So the end of it was that the champions sent messengers to Hampton and the castle of the Scour to tell what had betid, and they themselves took the road to the land of the wheat-wearers, having those women with them not as captives, but as free damsels. Now the road to the wheat-wearing country was long, and on the way the damsels told their new men many things of their land, and their unhappy wars with them of the burg, and the griefs and torments which they endured of them. And this, amongst other things, that wherever they came, they slew all the males, even to the sucking babe, but spared the women, even when they bore them not into captivity. Whereof, said these poor damsels, it cometh that our land is ill-furnished of carls, so that we women high and low go afield and do many things, as crafts and the like, which in other lands are done by carls. In sooth it seemed of them that they were both of stouter fashion, and defter than women are wont to be. So the champions, part in jest, part in earnest, bade them do on the armour of the slain burghers, and take their weapons, and fell to teaching them how to handle staff, and sword, and bow, and the women took heart from the valiant countenance of their new lovers, and deemed it all bitter earnest enough, and learned their part speedily, and yet none too soon. For when the fleers of the burg came home, the port lost no time, but sent out another host to follow after the champions and their spoil. For they had learned that those men had not turned about to Hampton after their victory, but had gone on to the wheat-wearers. So it befell that the host of the burg came up with the champions on the eve of a summer day when there were yet three hours of daylight. But whereas they had looked to have an easy bargain of their foemen, since they knew the champions to be but few, lo, there was the hillside covered with a goodly array of spears and glaives and shining helms. They marvelled, but now for very shame, and because they scarce could help it, they fell on, and before sunset were scattered to the winds again, and the fleers had to bear back the tale that the more part of their foes were women of the wheat-wearers. But this time few were those that came back alive to the burg of the four friths, for the freed captives were hot and eager in the chase, casting aside their shields and hauberks, that they might speed the better, and valuing their lives at naught, if they might but slay a man or two of the tyrants before they died. Thus was the burg wounded with its own sword, but the matter stopped not there, for when that victorious host of men and women came into the land of the wheat-wearers, all men fled away in terror at first, thinking that it was a new onset of the men of the burg and that all the more as so many of them bore their weapons and armour. But when they found out how matters had gone, then, as ye may deem, was the greatest joy and exultation, and carles and queens both ran to arms, and bade their deliverers learn them all that belonged to war, and said that one thing should not be lacking, to wit the gift of their bodies, that should either lie dead in the fields, or bear about henceforth the souls of free men. Nothing loath the champions became their doctors and teachers of battle, and a great host was drawn together, and meanwhile the champions had sent messengers again to Hampton, telling them what was befallen, and asking for more men if they might be had. But the burg abiders were not like to sit down under their foil. Another host they sent against the wheat-wearers, not so huge, as well arrayed and wise in war. The champions espied its goings, and knew well that they had to deal with the best men of the burg, and they met them in like wise, for they chose the very best of the men and the women, and pitched on a place whence they might ward them well, and abode the foemen there, who failed not to come upon them stout and stern and cold, and well learned in all feats of war. Long and bitter was the battle, and the burghers were fierce without headstrong folly, and the wheat-wearers deemed that if they blinched now they had something worse than death to look to. But in the end, when both sides were grown weary and worn out, and yet neither would flee, on a sudden came into the field the help from the dry tree, a valiant company of riders to whom battle was but game and play. Then, indeed, the men of the burg gave back, and drew out of the battle as best they might, yet were they little chased save by the newcomers of the dry tree, for the others were over-weary, and moreover the leaders had no mind to let the new-made warriors leave their vantage-ground, lest the old and tried men-at-arms of the burg should turn upon them and put them to the worse. Men looked for battle again the next day, but it fell not out so, for the host of the burg saw that there was more to lose than to gain, so they drew back towards their own place. Neither did they waste the land much, 
for the riders of the dry tree followed hard at heel and cut off all who tarried or strayed from the main battle when they were gone then at last did the wheat wearers give themselves up to the joy of their deliverance and the pleasure of their new lives and one of their old men that i have spoken with told me this that before when they were little better than the thralls of the burg and durst scarce raise a hand against the foemen the carls were but slow to love and the queens for all their fairness cold and but little kind however now in the fields of the wheat wearers themselves all this was changed and men and maids took to arraying themselves gaily as occasion served and there was singing and dancing on every green and straying of couples amongst the greenery of the summer night and in short the god of love was busy in the land and made the eyes seem bright and the lips sweet and the bosom fair and the arms sleek and the feet trim so that every hour was full of allurement and ever the nigher that war and peril was the more delight had man and maid of each other's bodies well within a while the wheat wearers were grown so full of hope that they bade the men of the dry tree lead them against the burg of the four friths and the champions were ready thereto because they wotted well that hampton being disgarnished of men the men of the burg might fall on it and even if they took it not they would beset all ways and make riding a hard matter for their fellowship so they fell to wisely and deliberately and led an host of the best of the carls with them and bade the women keep their land surely so that their host was not a great many but so wisely they led them that they came before the burg well nigh unawares and though it seemed little likely that they should take so strong a place yet naught less befell for the burg dwellers beset with cruelty and bitter anger cried out that now at last they would make an end of this cursed people and the horse and strong thieves their friends so they went out against a great multitude but in worser order than their wont was and there befell that marvel which sometimes befalleth even to very valiant men that now at the pinch all their valour flowed from them and they fled before the spears had met and in such evil order that the gates could not be shut and their foemen entered with them slaying and slaying even as they would so that in an hour's space the pride and the estate of the burg of the four friths was utterly fallen huge was the slaughter for the wheat wearers deemed they had many a grief whereof to avenge them nor were the men of the dry tree either sluggards or saints to be careless of their foemen or to be merciful in the battle but at last the murder was stayed and then the men of the wheat wearers went from house to house in the town to find the women of their folk who had been made thralls by the burghers there then was many a joyful meeting betwixt those poor women and the men of their kindred all was forgotten now of the days of their thraldom their toil and mocking and stripes and within certain days all the sort of them came before the host clad in green raiment and garlanded with flowers for the joy of their deliverance and great feast was made to them as for them of the burg the battle and chase over no more were slain save that certain of the great ones were made shorter by the head but the champions and the wheat wearers both said that none of that bitter and cruel folk should abide any longer in the town so that after a delay long enough for them to provide stuff for their wayfaring they were all thrust out a gates rich and poor old and young man woman and child proudly and with a stout countenance they went for now was their valour come again to them and it is like that we shall hear of them oft again for though they had but a few weapons amongst them when they were driven out of their old home and neither hauberk nor shield nor helm yet so learned in war be they and so marvellous great of pride that they will somehow get them weapons and even armed but with headless staves and cudgels of the thicket woe betide the peaceful folk whom they shall first fall on yea fair sir the day shall come meseemeth when folk shall call on thee to lead the hunt after these famished wolves and when thou dost so call on me to tell thee tales of their doings which shall make thine heart hard and thine hand heavy against them meantime said ralph what has betid to the fellowship of the dry tree for i see that thou hast some grief on thy mind because of them roger kept silence a little and then he said i grieve because hampton is no more a strong place of warriors two or three carls and a dozen of women dwell now in the halls and chambers of the scow here on earth all endeth god send us to find the world without end what then said ralph have they then had another great overthrow worse than that other nay said roger doggedly it is not so but where is the fellowship said ralph it is scattered abroad quoth roger 
for some of the dry tree had no heart to leave the women whom they had wooed in the wheat wearer's land and some and a great many have taken their deers to dwell in the burg of the four friths whereas many of the wheat wearers have gone to beget children on the old bond women of the burghers of whom there were some two thousand alive after the burg was taken besides that many women also came with the carls from their own land so that now a mixed folk are dwelling in the burg partly of those women thralls partly of carls and queens come newly from the wheat wearers partly of men of our fellowship the more part of whom are wedded to queens of the wheat wearers and partly of men chapmen and craftsmen and others who have drifted into the town having heard that there is no lack of wealth there and many fair women unmated yea said ralph and is all this so ill said roger meseems it is ill enough that there is no longer rightly said a fellowship of the dry tree though the men be alive who are once of that fellowship nay said ralph and why should they not make a new fellowship in the burg whereas they may well be peaceful since they have come to their above of their foemen yea said roger slowly that is sooth and so is this that there in the burg they are a strong band with a captain of their own and much worshipped of the peaceful folk and moreover though they be not cruel to torment helpless folk or hard to make an end of all joy to-day lest they lose their joy to-morrow they now array all men in good order within the burg so that it shall be no easier for a foeman to win that erst it was what man said ralph then be of better cheer and come thou with us and maybe the old steel of the champions may look on the sun down upmeads come thou with me i say and show me in my luck to some of thy fellows who are dwelling in the burg and it may be when thou hast told my tale to them that some of them shall be content to leave their beds cold for a while that they may come help a friend of the well in his need roger sat silent as if he were pondering the matter while richard and the sage both of them took up the word one after the other and urged him to it at last he said well so be it for this adventure only i say not that i shall give up this hermitage and my holiness for ever come thou aside wise man of swevenham and i shall tell thee wherefore yea said ralph laughing and when he hath told thee tell me not again for sure i am that he is right to go with us and belike shall be wrong in his reason therefore roger looked a little askance at him and he went without doors with the sage and when they were out of earshot he said to him hearken i would have gone with my lord at the first word and have been fain thereof but there is this woman that followeth him at every turn she shall mind me of our lady that was and i shall loathe her and her fairness in the allurements of her body because i see of her that she it is that hath gotten my lady's luck and that but for her my lady might yet have been alive said the sage well quoth my lord that thou wouldst give me a fool's reason what dost not thou know thou that knowest so much of the lady of abundance that she it was who ordained this ursula to be ralph's bedmate when she herself should be gone from him were she dead or alive and that she also should be a friend of the well so that he might not lack a fellow his life long but this thou sayest not knowing the mind of our lady and how she loved him in her inmost heart roger hung his head and spake not for a while and then he said well wise man i have said that i will go on this adventure and i will smooth my tongue for this while at least and for what may come hereafter let it be and now we are best get to horse for what with meat and minstrelsy we have worn away the day till it wants but a little of noon go tell thy lord that i am ready farewell peace and welcome war and grudging so the sage went within and came out with the others and they mounted their horses anon and roger went ahead on foot and led them through the thicket ways without fumbling and they lay down that night on the farther side of the swelling flood End of chapter 17、18、of the Well at the World's End, Book Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book Four, by William Morris. Chapter eighteen A Change of Days in the Burg of the Four Friths 
there is naught to tell of their ways till they came out of the thicket into the fields about the burg of the four friths and even there was a look of a bettering of men's lives though forsooth the husbandmen there were much the same as had abided in the fields aforetime whereas they were not for the most part freemen of the burg but aliens who did service in war and otherwise thereto but it being eventide there were men and women and children who had come out of gates walking about and disporting themselves in the loveliness of early summer and that in far merrier guise than they had durst do in the bygone days moreover there was scarce a sword or spear to be seen amongst them whereat roger grudged somewhat and richard said meseems this folk trusts the peace of the burg over much since when all is told unpeace is not so far from their borders but as they drew a little nigher ralph pointed out to his fellows the gleam of helms and weapons on the walls and they saw a watchman on each of the high towers of the south gate and then quoth roger nay the burg will not be won so easily and if a few fools get themselves slain outside it is no great matter folk nowise let them come up to the gate unheeded but gathered about them to look at the newcomers but not so as to hinder them and they could see that these summerers were goodly folk enough and demeaned them as though they had but few troubles weighing on them but the wayfarers were not unchallenged at the gate for a stout man-at-arms stayed them and said ye ride somewhat late friends what are ye quoth ralph we be peaceful wayfarers save to them that would fall on us and we seek toward upmeads yea said the man belike ye shall find something less than peace betwixt here and upmeads for rumour goes that there are alien riders come into the lands of higham and for aught i know the said unpeace may spread further on well if you will go to the flower de luce and abide there this night ye shall have a let pass to morn betimes then ralph spoke a word in roger's ear and roger nodded his head and throwing his cowl aback went up to the man-at-arms and said stephen ahurst hast thou time for a word with an old friend yea roger said the man is it verily thou i deem that thou hadst fled away from all of us to live in the wilds so it was lad said roger but times change from good to bad and back again and now am i of this good lord's company and i shall tell thee stephen that though he rideth but few to-day yet merry shall he be that rideth with him to-morrow if unpeace be in the land lo you stephen this is the child of upmeads whom belike thou hast heard of and if thou wilt take me into the chamber of thy tower i will tell thee things of him that thou wottest not stephen turned to ralph and made obeisance to him and said fair sir there are tales going about concerning thee some whereof are strange enow but none of them ill and i deem by the look of thee that thou shalt be both a stark champion and a good lord and i deem that it shall be my good luck if i see more of thee and much more now if thou wilt pass on with thine other fellows to the flower de luce and leave this my old fellow in arms with me and he shall tell thee of thy mind for i see that thou wouldst have somewhat of us and since i doubt not by the looks of thee that thou wilt not bid us aught unknightly when we know thy will we shall try to pleasure thee yea lord ralph said roger thou mayest leave all the business with me and i will come to thee not later than betimes to-morrow and let thee wot how matters have sped and methinks ye may hope to wind out a gates this time otherwise than thou didst before so ralph gave him yea say and thanked the man-at-arms and rode his ways with the others toward the flower de luce and whereas the sun was but newly set ralph noted that the booths were gayer and the houses brighter and more fairly adorned than aforetimes as for the folk they were such that the streets seemed full of holiday-makers so joyous and well dight were they and the women liked to those fair thralls whom he had seen that other time saying that they were not clad so wantonly however gaily they came into the great square and there they saw that the masons and builders had begun on the master church to make it fairer and bigger the people were sporting there as in the streets and amongst them were some weaponed men but the most part of these bore the token of the dry tree so they entered the flower de luce and had good welcome there as if they were come home to their own house for when its people saw such a goodly old man in the sage and so stout and trim a knight as was richard and above all when they beheld the loveliness of ralph and ursula they praised them open-mouthed and could scarce make enough of them and when they had had their meat and were rested came two of the maids there and asked them if it were lawful to talk with them and ralph laughed and bade them sit by them and eat a dainty morsel and they took that blushing for they were fair and young and ralph's face and the merry words of his mouth stirred the hearts within them 
and forsooth it was not so much they that spake as ursula and the sage for ralph was somewhat few spoken whereas he pondered concerning the coming days and what he half deemed that he saw a doing at upmeads but at last they found their tongues and said how that already rumour was abroad that they were in the burg who had drunk the water of the well at the world's end and said one it is indeed a fair sight to see you folk coming back in triumph and so methinks will many deem if ye abide with us over to-morrow and yet lady for a while we are well nigh as joyous as ye can be whereas we have but newly come into new life also some of us from very thraldom of the most grievous and i am of those and some of us in daily peril of it like to my sister here so may happen said she smiling none of us shall seek to the well until we have worn our present bliss a little threadbare ursula smiled on her but the sage said may happen it is of no avail speaking of such things to a young and fair woman but what would betide you if the old burghers were to come back and win their walls again the maid who had been a thrall changed countenance at his word but the other one said if the burghers come back they will find them upon the walls who have already chased them thou mayest deem me slim and tender old wise man but such as mine arm is it has upheaved the edges against the foe and if it be murder to slay a burgher then i am worthy of the gallows yea yea quoth richard laughing ye shall be double manned then in this good town ye may well win unless the sight of you shall make the foe over fierce for the gain said the sage it is well maiden and if ye hold to that and keep your corals in the same road ye need not to fear the burghers and to say sooth i have it in my mind that before long ye shall have both war and victory then ralph seemed to wake up as from a dream and he arose and said thou art in the right sage and to mine eyes it seemeth that both thou and i shall be sharers in the war and the victory and therewith he fell to striding up and down the hall while the two maidens sat gazing on him with gleaming eyes and flushed cheeks but in a little while he came back to his seat and sat down and fell to talk with the women and asked them of the town and the building therein and the markets whether they throve and they and two or three of the townsmen or merchants answered all and told him how fair their estate was and how thriving was the lot of one and all with them therewith was ralph well pleased and they sat talking there in good fellowship till the night was somewhat worn and all men fared to bed End of chapter 18chapter 19 of the well at the world's end book 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the well at the world's end book 4 by william morris chapter 19 ralph sees hampton and the scour when it was morning ralph arose and went into the hall of the hostelry and even as he entered it the outside door opened and in came roger and richard with him for he had been astir very early and roger who was armed from head to foot and wore a coat of the dry tree cried out now lord thou wert best do on thy war gear for thou shalt presently be captain of an host yea roger quoth ralph and hast thou done well well enough said richard thine host shall not be a great one but no man in it will be a blencher, for they be all champions of the dry tree. Yea, quoth Roger, so it was that Stephen a Hurst brought me to a company of my old fellows. And we went all of us together to the captain of the burg, e'en he of the dry tree, who in these latest days is made captain of all, and did him to wit that thou hadst a need. And whereas he, as all of us, had heard of the strokes that thou struckest in the wood that day when thy happiness first began, woe worth the while he stickled not to give some of us leave to look on the hand play with thee but soft my lord abound not in thanks as yet till i tell thee the said captain hath gotten somewhat of the mind of a chapman by dwelling in a town tis like the saints forgive me for saying so and would strike a bargain with thee yea said ralph smiling i partly guess what like the bargain is but say thou said roger i like not his bargain not for thy sake but mine own this it is that we shall ride all of us who are to be of thy fellowship to the castle of the scour to-day and there thy lady shall sit in the throne 
whereas in past days our lady and queen was wont to sit and that thou shalt swear upon her head that whensoever he biddeth thee come to the help of the burg of the four friths and the tribes of the wheat wearers thou shalt come in arms by the straightest road with such fellowship as thou mayst gather and if thou wilt so do we of the dry tree who go with thee on this journey are thine to save or to spend by flood or field or castle wall amidst the edges and the shafts and the fire flaunt what sayest thou thou who art lucky and hast of late become wise and i will tell thee that though i hope it not yet i would thou shouldst nay say it for it will be hard for me to see another woman sitting on our lady's seat yea to see her sitting there who hath stolen her luck said ralph now this proper of the captains i call friendly and knightly and i will gladly swear as he will all the more as without any oath i should never fail him whensoever he may send for me as for thee roger ride with us if thou wilt and thou shalt be welcome both in the company and at the high house of upmeads when so we come there then was roger silent but nowise abashed and as they spoke they heard the tramp of horses and the clash of weapons and they saw through the open door three men-at-arms riding up to the house so ralph went out to welcome them they were armed full well in bright armour and their coats were of the dry tree and were tall men and warrior-like they hailed ralph as captain and he gave them the seal of the day and bade come in and drink a cup so did they but they were scarce off their horses ere there came another three and then six together and so one after another till the hall of the flower de luce was full of the gleam of steel and clash of armour and the lads held their horses without and were merry with the sight of the stalwart men-at-arms now cometh ursula down from her chamber clad in her bravery and when they saw her they set up a shout for joy of her so that the rafters rang again but she laughed for the pleasure of them and poured them out the wine till they were merrier with the sight of her than with the good liquor now roger comes to ralph and tells him he deems his host hath come to the last man then ralph armed him and those two maidens brought him his horse and they mount all of them and draw up in the square and roger and stephen a hearse array them for they were chosen of them as leaders along with ralph and richard whom they all knew at least by hearsay then roger drew from his pouch a parchment and read the roll of names and there was no man lacking and they were three score save five besides roger and the wayfarers and never was a band of like number seen better and richard said softly unto ralph if we had a few more of these i should care little what foemen we should meet in upmeads soothly my lord they had as well have ridden into red hell as into our green fields fear not richard said ralph we shall have enough so then they rode out of the square and through the streets to the north gate and much folk was abroad to look on them and they blessed them as they went both carls and queens for the rumour was toward that there was riding a good and dear lord and a friend of the well to get his own again from out of the hands of the aliens herewith they ride a little trot through the freedom of the burg and when they were clear of it they turned aside from the woodland highway whereon ralph had erst ridden with roger and followed the rides a good way till it was past noon when they came into a very close thicket where there was but a narrow and winding way whereon two men might not ride abreast and roger said now if we were the old burghers and the dry tree still holding the scour we should presently know what steel point dinner meaneth if the dead could rise out of their graves to greet their foemen we should anon be a merry company here but at last they learned the trick and were wont to fetch a compass round about grey goose thicket as it hight amongst us well said ralph but how if there by any waylaying us the burghers may be wiser still than thou deemest and ye may have learned them more than thou art minded to think nay said roger i bade half a score turn aside by the thicket path on our left hands that shall make all sure but indeed i look for no lurkers as yet in a month's time that may betide but not yet not yet but tell me fair sir have ye any deeming of where thou mayest get thee more folk who be not afraid of the hard hand play for richard hath been telling me that there be tidings in the air said ralph if hope play me not false i look to gather some stout carles of the shepherd country yea said roger but i shall tell thee that they have been at whiles unfriends of the dry tree 
said Ralph, I think they will be friends unto me. Then it shall do well, said Roger, for they be good in a fray. So they talked as they rode, but ever Roger would give no heed to Ursula, but made as if he wotted not that she was there, though ever and anon Ralph would be turning back to speak to her and help her through the passes. At last the thicket began to dwindle, and presently riding out of a little valley or long trench on to a ridge nearly bare of trees, they saw below them a fair green plain, and in the midst of it a great heap of grey rocks rising out of it like a reef out of the sea. And on the said reef, and climbing up as it were to the topmost of it, the white walls of a great castle, the crown whereof was a huge round tower. At the foot of the ridge was a thorpe of white houses, thatched with straw scattered over a good piece of the plain. The company drew rein on the ridge-top, and the champions raised a great shout at the sight of their old strong place, and Roger turned to Ralph and said, Fair sir, how deemest thou of the castle of the scour? But Richard broke in, For my part, friend Roger, I deem that ye do like to people unlearned in war to leave the stronghold ungarnished of men. This is a fool's deed. Nay, nay, said Roger, we need not be over hasty while it is our chief business to order the mingled folk of the wheat wearers and others who dwell in the burg as now. Then spake Ralph, Yet how wilt thou say but that the foemen whom we go to meet in Upmeads may be some of these very burghers? Hast thou heard whether they have found a new dwelling among some unhappy folk or be still roving? Maybe they shall deem Upmeads fair. Spake Michael a Hurst, By thy leave, fair sir. We have had a word of those riders and strong thieves that they have fetched a far compass, and got them armor, and become into the woodlands north of the wood debatable. For like all strong thieves, they love the wood. Roger laughed. Yea, as we did, friend Michael, when we were thieves, whereas now we be lords and gentlemen. But as to thy tidings, I set not much by them, for of the same message was this word that they had already fallen on high and by the way. And we know that this cannot be true, since though forsooth the abbot has had unpeace on his hands, we know where his foemen came from, the west to wit, and the banded barons. Yea, yea, quoth the sage, but may not the burghers have taken service with them? Yea, forsooth, quoth Roger, but I deem not, or we had been surer thereof. Thus they spake, and they lighted down all of them to breathe their horses. And Ursula spake with Ralph as they walked the greensward together a little apart, and said, Sweetheart, I am afraid of today. Yes, dear, said he, and wherefore? She said, It will be hard for me to enter that grim house yonder, and sit in the seat whence I was erewhile threatened by the evil hag with hair like a grey she-bear. He made much of her, and said, Yet be like a friend of the well may overcome this also, and with all the hall shall be far other today when it was. She looked about on the warriors as they lay on the grass or loitered by their horses. Then she smiled, and her face lightened, and she reddened and cast down her eyes, and said, Yea, that is sooth. That day there were few men in the hall, and they old and evil of semblance. It was a band of women who took me in the thorpe, and brought me up into the castle, and mishandled me there, and cast me into prison there. Whereas these be good fellows, and frank and free of aspect. But, O oh my heart, look thou how fearful the piled-up rocks rise from the plain, and the walls wind up amongst them, and that huge tower, the crown of all. Surely there is none more fearful in the world. He kissed her and laughed merrily, and said, Yea, sweetheart, and there will be another change in the folk of the hall when we come there this time, to wit, that thou shouldst not be alone therein, even were all these champions and Richard and the sage away from thee. Wilt thou tell me how that shall be? She turned to him, and kissed him, and caressed him, and then they turned back again toward their fellows, for by now they had walked together a good way along the ridge. So then they got to horse again, and rode into the thorpe, where men and women stood about to behold them, and made them humble reverence as they passed by. So rode they to the bailey of the castle, and if that stronghold looked terrible from the ridge above, tenfold more terrible of aspect it was when the upper parts were hidden by the grey rocks, and they so huge and beetling, and though the sun was bright about them, and they in the midst of their friends, yet even Ralph felt somewhat of a dread creep over him. Yet he smiled cheerfully, 
as Ursula turned an anxious face on him. They alighted from their horses in the bailey, for over steep for horses' hooves was the walled way upward. And as they began to mount, even the merry champions hushed their holiday clamour for awe of the huge stronghold, and Ralph took Ursula by the hand, and she sidled up to him and said softly, Yea, it was here they drave me up, those women, thrusting and smiting me, and some would have stripped off my raiment. But one who seemed the wisest said, Nay, leave her till she come before the ancient lady, for her gear may be a token of whence she is, and whither if she be come as a spy. So I escaped them for that moment, and now I wonder what we shall find in the hall when we come in thither. It is somewhat like to me as when one gets up from bed in the dead night when all is quiet and the moon is shining, and goes out of the chamber into the hall, and coming back almost dreads to see some horror lying in one's place amid the familiar bedclothes. And she grew paler as she spoke. Then Ralph comforted her and trimmed his countenance to a look of mirth, but inwardly he was ill at ease. So up they went, and up till they came to a level place whereon was built the chief hall and its chambers. There they stood a while to breathe them before the door, which was rather low than great. And Ursula clung to Ralph and trembled. But Ralph spake in her ear, Take heart, my sweeter, these men and Roger in especial will think the worse of thee, and thou a friend of the well. What? Here is not to hurt thee. This is not beside the perils of the desert, and the slaves, and the evil lord of Utterball. Yea, she said, but meseemeth I love thee not so sore as now I do. O friend, I am become a weak woman and unvaliant, and there is not in me but love of thee, and love of life because of thee. Nor dost thou know altogether what befell me in that hall. But Ralph turned about and cried out in a loud, cheerful voice, Let us enter, friends, and lo, you, I will show the champions of the dry tree the way into their own hall and high place. Therewith he thrust the door open, for it was not locked, and strode into the hall, still leading Ursula by the hand. And all the company followed him, the clash of their armor resounding through the huge building. Though it was long, it was not so much that it was long as that it was broad and exceeding high, so that in the dusk of it the great vault of the roof was dim and misty. There was no man therein, no hauling on its walls, no benches nor boards, not but the great standing table of stone on the dais, and the stone high seat amidst of it. And the place did verily seem like the house and hall of a people that had died out in one hour because of their evil deeds. They stood still a moment when they were all fairly within doors, and Roger thrust up to Ralph and said but softly, The woman is blenching, and all for naught. Were it not for the oath we had best left her in the thorpe. I fear me she will bring evil days on our old home with her shivering fear. How far otherwise came our lady in hither when first she came amongst us, when the duke of us found her in the wood, after she had been thrust out from some way by the baron whom thou slewest afterward. Our duke brought her in hither wrapped up in his knight's scarlet cloak, and went up with her on to the dais. But when she came thither she turned about and let her cloak fall to the earth, and stood there barefoot in her smock as she had been cast out into the wildwood. And she spread abroad her hands, and cried out in a loud voice as sweet as the May blackbird, May God bless this house and abode of the valiant, and the shelter of the hapless. Said Ursula, and her voice was firm, and the color came back to her cheeks now, while Ralph stood agaze and wondering, Roger, thou lovest me little, me seemeth, though if I did less than I do, I should do against the will of thy lady that was queen in this hall. But tell me, Roger, where is gone that other one, the fearful she-bear of this crag, who sat in yonder stone high seat and roared at me, and mocked me, and gave me over into the hands of her tormentors, who haled me away to the prison wherefrom thy very lady delivered me? Lady, said Roger, the tale of her is short since the day thou sawest her herein. On the day when we first had the evil tidings of the slaying of my lady, we were sad at heart and called to mind ancient transgressions against us. Therefore we fell on the she-bear, as thou callest her, and her company of men and women, and some we slew, and some we thrust forth. But as to her, I slew her not three feet from where thou standest now. A rumour there is that she walketh, and it may be so. Yet in the summer noon ye need not look to see her. 
Ralph said coldly. Roger, let us be done with minstrels' tales. Lead me to the place where the oath is to be sworn, for time presses. Scarce were the words out of his mouth ere Roger strode forward and gat him on to the dais, and went hastily to the wall behind the high seat, whence he took down a very great horn, and set it to his lips, and winded it loudly thrice, so that the great and high hall was full of its echoes. Richard started thereat, and half drew his sword. But the sage put his hand upon the hilts, and said, It is not. Let the edges lie quiet. Ursula stared astonished, but now she quaked no more. Ralph changed not countenance a whit, and the champions of the tree made as if naught had been done that they looked not for. But thereafter cried Roger from the dais, This is the token that the men of the dry tree are met for matters of import. Thus is the moat hallowed. Come up hither, ye aliens, and ye also of the fellowship, that the oath may be sworn, and we may go our ways, even as the alien captain biddeth. Then Ralph took Ursula's hand again, and went up to the hall calmly and proudly, and the champions followed with Richard and the sage. Ralph and Ursula went up on to the dais, and he set down Ursula in the stone high seat, and even in the hall dusk a right fair-coloured picture she looked therein, for she was clad in a goodly green gown broidered with flowers, and a green cloak with gold orphreys over it. Her hair was spread abroad over her shoulders, and on her head was a garland of roses which the women of the Flower de Luce had given her. So there she sat with her fair face, whence now all the wrinkles of trouble and fear were smoothed out, looking like an image of the early summer tide itself. And the champions looked on her and marvelled, and one whispered to the other that it was their lady of aforetime come back again. Only Roger, who had now gone back to the rest of the fellowship, cast his eye upon the ground and muttered, now Ralph draws his sword, and lays it naked on the stone table, and he stood beside Ursula, and said, Champions of the dry tree, by the blade of Upmeads which lieth here before me, and by the head which I love best in the world, and is best worthy of love, and herewith he laid his hand on Ursula's head, I swear that whensoever the captain of the dry tree calleth on me, whether I be eating or drinking, abed or standing on my feet, at peace or at war, glad or sorry, I shall do my utmost to come to his aid straightway with whatso force I may gather. Is this rightly sworn, champions? Said Stephen Ahurst, It is sworn well and nightly, and now cometh our oath. Nay, said Ralph, I had no mind to drive a bargain with you. Your deeds shall prove you, and I fear not for your dotiness said Stephen, Yea, Lord, but he bade us swear to thee. Reach me thy sword, I pray thee. Then Ralph reached him his sword across the great stone table, and Stephen took it, and kissed the blade and the hilts, and then lifted up his voice and said, By the hilts and the blade, by the point and the edge, we swear to follow the Lord Ralph of Upmeads for a year and a day, and to do his will in all wise. So help us God in all hallows. And therewith he gave the sword to others, and each man of them kissed it as he had. But Ralph said, Champions, for this oath I thank you all heartily, but it is not my meaning that I should hold you by me for a year, whereas I deem I shall do all that my kindred may need in three days' space from the first hour wherein we set foot in Upmeads. Stephen smiled friendly at him, and nodded, and said, That may well be. But now to make a good end of this moat, I will tell thee a thing to wit that our captain, yea, and all we, are minded to try thee by this fray in Upmeads, now we know that thou hast become a friend of the well. And if thou turn out as we deem is likest, we will give thee this castle of the scour for thee and those that shall spring from thy loins, for we deem that some such man as thou will be the only one to hold it worthily and in such wise as it may be a stronghold against tyrants and for the helping of peaceable folk, since forsooth we of the dry tree have heard somewhat of the well at the world's end, and trow in the might thereof. He made an end, and Ralph kept silence and pondered the matter. But Roger lifted up his head and broke in and said, Yea, yea, that is it. We are all become men of peace, we riders of the dry tree and he laughed withal, but as one nowise best pleased. But as Ralph was gathering his words together, and Ursula was looking up to him with trouble in her face again, came a man of the thorpe rushing into the hall, and cried out, O oh, my lords, 
there are weaponed men coming forth from the thicket. Save us, we pray you, for we are ill-weaponed and men of peace. Roger laughed and said, Eh, hey, good man, so ye want us back again. But my lord Ralph, and thou Richard, and thou Stephen, come ye to the shot-window here that giveth on to the forest. We are high up here, and we shall see all as clearly as in a good mirror. Hast thou shut the gates, Carl? Yea, Lord Roger, quoth he, and there are some fifty of us together down in the base court. Ralph and Richard and Stephen looked forth from the shot window, and saw verily a band of men riding down the bent into the thorpe. And Ralph, who as aforesaid was far-sighted and clear-sighted, said, Yea, it is strange, but without doubt these are riders of the dry tree, and they seem to me to be some ten score. Thou Stephen, thou Roger, what is to hand? Is your captain wont to give a gift and take it back, and somewhat more with it? Stephen looked abashed at his word, and Roger hung his head again. But therewith the sage drew up to them, and said, Be not dismayed, Lord Ralph. What wert thou going to say to the champions when this carl break in? This, said Ralph, that I thank the dry tree heartily for its gift, but that me seemeth it not wise to leave this stronghold disgarnished of men till I can come or send back from Upmeads. Stephen's face cleared at the word, and he said, I bid thee believe it, Lord, that there is no treason in our captain's heart, and that if there were I would fight against him and his men on thy behalf. And Roger, though in a somewhat surly voice, said the like. Ralph thought a little, and then he said, It is well. Go we down and out of the gates to meet them, that we may the sooner get on our way to Upmeads. And without more words he went up to Ursula and took her hand and went out of the hall, and down the rock-cut stair and all they with him. And when they came into the base court, Ralph spoke to the carles of the thorpe, who stood huddled together sore feared, and said, Throw open the gates. These riders who have so scared you are not else than the champions of the dry tree who are coming back to their stronghold, that they may keep you sure against wicked tyrants who would oppress you. The carles looked askance at one another, but straightway opened the gates, and Ralph and his company went forth and abode the newcomers on a little green mound half a bowshot from the castle. Ralph sat down on the grass, and Ursula by him, and she said, My heart tells me that these champions are no traitors, however rough and fierce they have been, and still shall be if occasion serve. But, O oh, sweetheart, how dear and sweet is this sunlit greensward after yonder grim hold! Surely, sweet, it shall never be our dwelling. I wot not, beloved, said he. Must we not go and dwell where deeds shall lead us? And the hand of weird is mighty. But lo thou, here are the newcomers to hand. So it was as he said, and presently the whole band came before them, and they were all of the dry tree, stout men and well weaponed, and they had ridden exceeding fast, so that their horses were somewhat spent. A tall man, very gallantly armed, who rode at their head, leaped at once from his horse and came up to Ralph and hailed him and Roger and Stephen, both made obeisance to him. Ralph, who had risen up, hailed him in his turn, and the tall man said, I am the captain of the dry tree, for lack of a better. Art thou Ralph of Upmeads, fair sir? Even so, said Ralph. Said the captain, Thou wilt marvel that I have ridden after thee on the spur, so here is the tale shortly. Your backs were not turned on the walls of the burg an hour, ere three of my riders brought in to me a man who said, and gave me tokens of his word being true, that he had fallen in with a company of the old burghers in the wood debatable, which belike thou wottest of. All we of Upmeads wot of it, said Ralph. Well, said the captain, amongst these said burghers, who were dwelling in the wildwood in summer content, the word went free that they would gather to them other bands of strong thieves who haunt that wood, and go with them upon Upmeads, and from Upmeads, when they were waxen strong, they would fall upon Hyam by the way, and thence with yet more strength on their old dwelling of the burg. Now whereas I know that thou art of Upmeads, and also what thou art, and what thou hast done, I have ridden after thee to tell thee what is toward. But if thou deemest I have brought thee all these riders, it is not wholly so. For it was borne into my mind that our old stronghold was left bare of men, and I knew not what might betide and that the more, as more than one man has told us how that another band of the disinherited burghers have fallen upon Hyam, or the lands thereof, and Hyam is no great way hence, 
so that some five score of these riders are to hold our castle of the scour and the rest are for thee to ride afield with as for the others thou hast been told already that the scour in hampton therewith is a gift from us to thee for henceforward we be the lords of the burg of the four friths and that is more than enough for us ralph thanked the captain for this and did him to wit he would take the gift if he came back out the upmeads fray alive said he with thee and the wheat wearers in the burg and me in the scour no strong thief shall dare lift up his hand in these parts the captain smiled and ralph went on and now i must needs ask thee for leave to depart which is all the more needful whereas thy men have overridden their horses and we must needs go a soft pace till we come to Hyam. yea art thou for Hyam, fair sir said the captain that is well for ye may get men therefrom and at the least it is likely that ye shall bear tidings as to my men and their horses this hath been looked to for five hundred good men of the wheat wearers men who have not learned the feat of arms a horseback are coming through the woods hither to help ward thy castle fair lord they will be here in some three hours space and will bring horses for thy five score men therefore do ye but ride softly to Hyam, and if these sergeants catch up with you it is well but if not abide them at Hyam. thanks have thou for this once more said ralph and now i have no more word than this for thee that i will come to thee at thy least word and serve thee with all that i have to my very life if need be and yet i must say this that i wot not why ye and these others are become to me who am alien to you as very brothers said the captain there is this to be said of it as was aforesaid that all we count thy winning of the well at the world's end as valiancy in the yea and luck with all but moreover she who was our lady would have had thee for her friend had she lived and how then could we be less than friends to thee depart in peace my friend and we look to see thee again in a little while therewith he kissed him and bade farewell and ralph bade his band to horse and they were in the saddle in a twinkling and rode away from hampton at a soft pace but as they went ralph turned to ursula and said and now belike we shall see burton abbess once more and the house where i first saw thee and oh how sweet thou wert and i was so happy and so young yea she said and sorely i longed for thee and now we have long been together as it seemeth and yet that long space shall be but a little while of our lives but my friend as to burton abbas i misdoubt me of our seeing it for there is a nigher road by the byways to Hyam, which these men know and doubtless that way we shall wend and i am glad thereof for i shall tell thee that somewhat i fear that thorpe lest it should lay hold of me and wake me from a dream yea said ralph but even then belike thou shouldst find me beside thee as if i had fallen asleep in the alehouse and dreamed of the well at the world's end and then awoke and seen the dear barefoot maid busying her about her house and its matters that were not so ill ah she said look round on thy men and think of the might of war that is in them and think of the deeds to come but oh how i would that these next few days were worn away and we yet alive for a long while end of section nineteen recording by philip gould chapter twenty of the well at the world's end book four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Well at the World's End, Book Four, by William Morris. Chapter Twenty. They come to the gate of Hyam by the way. It was as Ursula had deemed, and they made for Hyam by the shortest road, so that they came before the gate a little before sunset. To the very gate they came not for there were strong barriers before it and men-at-arms within them as though they were looking for an onfall and amongst these were bowmen who bended their bows on ralph and his company so ralph stayed his men and rode up to the barriers with richard and stephen a hurst all three of them bareheaded with their swords in the sheaths and stephen moreover bearing a white cloth on a truncheon then a knight of the town very bravely armed 
came forth from the barriers and went up to ralph and said fair sir art thou a knight yea said ralph said the knight who be ye i hight ralph of upmeads said ralph and these be my men and we pray thee for guesting in the town of my lord abbot to-night and leave to depart to-morrow betimes o oh, unhappy young man said the knight meseems these men be not so much thine as thou art theirs for they are of the dry tree and bear their token openly wilt thou then lodge thy company of strong thieves with honest men stephen a hurst laughed roughly at this word but ralph said mildly these men are indeed of the dry tree but they are my men and under my rule and they be riding on my errands which be lawful the knight was silent a while and then he said well it may be so but into this town they come not for the tale of them is over long for honest men to hearken to even as he spake a man at arms somewhat evilly armed shoved through the barriers thrusting aback certain of his fellows and coming up to ralph stood staring up into his face with the tears starting into his eyes ralph looked a moment and then reached down his arms to embrace him and kissed his face for lo it was his own brother hugh withal he whispered in his ear get thee behind us hugh if thou wilt come with us lad so hugh passed on quietly toward the band while ralph turned to the knight again who said to him who is that man he is mine own brother said ralph be he the brother of whom he will said the knight he was none the less our sworn man ye fools said he turning toward the men in the barrier why did ye not slay him he slipped out said they before we wotted what he was about said the knight where were your bows then said a man they were pressing so hard on the barrier that we could not draw a bowstring besides how might we shoot him without hitting thee belike the knight turned toward ralph grown wroth and surly and that the more he saw stephen and richard grinning he said fair sir you have strengthened the old saw that saith tell me what thy friends are and i will tell thee what thou art thou hast stolen our man with not a word on it fair sir said ralph meseemeth thou makest more words than enough about it shall i buy my brother of thee then i have a few good pieces in my pouch the captain shook his head angrily well said ralph how can i please thee fair sir quoth the knight thou canst please me best by turning thy horses heads away from higham all the sort of you he stepped back towards the barriers and then came forward again and said look you man-at-arms i warn thee that i trust thee not and deem that thou liest now have i mind to issue out and fall upon you for ye shall be evil guests in my lord abbot's lands now at last ralph waxed somewhat wroth and he said come out then if you will and we shall meet you man for man there is yet light on this lily lee and we will do so much for thee churl though thou be but as he spoke came the sounds of horns and lo over the bent showed the points of spears and then all those five score of the dry tree whom the captain had sent after ralph came pouring down the bent the knight looked on them under the sharp of his hand till he saw the dry tree on their coats also and then he turned and got him hastily into the barriers and when he was amongst his own men he fell to roaring out a defiance to ralph and a bolt flew forth and two or three shafts but hurt no one richard and stephen drew their swords but ralph cried out come away friends tarry not to bicker with these fools who are afraid of they know not what 
it is but lying under the naked heaven to-night instead of under the rafters but we have all lodged thus a many times and we shall be nigher to our journey's end to-morrow when we wake up therewith he turned his horse with richard and stephen and came to his own men there was much laughter and jeering at the abbot's men amidst of the dry tree both of those who had ridden with ralph and the newcomers but they arrayed them to ride further in good order and presently were skirting the walls of higham out of bowshot and making for the down country by the clear of the moon the sergeants had gotten a horse for hugh and by ralph's bidding he rode beside him as they went their ways and the two brethren talked together lovingly End of chapter twenty recording by john brandon chapter twenty one of the well at the world's end book four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the well at the world's end book four chapter twenty one talk between those two brethren ralph asked hugh first if he wotted aught of gregory their brother hugh laughed and pointed to hyam and said he is yonder what said ralph and the abbot's host yea said hugh laughing again but in his spiritual not his worldly host he is turned monk brother that is he is already a novice and will be a brother of the abbey in six months space said ralph and launcelot longtongue thy squire how hath he sped said hugh he is yonder also but in the worldly host not the spiritual he is a sergeant of theirs and somewhat of a catch for them for he is no ill man at arms as thou wottest and besides he adorneth everything with words so that men hearken to him gladly but tell me said ralph how it befalleth that the abbot's men of war be so churlish and chary of the inside of their town what have they to fear is not the lord abbot still a mighty man hugh shook his head there hath been a change of days at hyam though i say not but that the knights are over careful and much over fearful what is the change been said ralph hugh said in time past my lord abbot was indeed a mighty man and both this town of hyam was well garnished of men-at-arms and also many of his manors had castles and strong-houses on them and the yeomen were ready to run to their weapons when so the gathering was blown in short Hyam was as mighty as it was wealthy, and the abbot's men had not to do with any save with thy friends here who bear the tree leafless. All else feared those holy walls and the well-blessed men who warded them. But the dry tree feared, as men said, neither man nor devil, and I hope it may be so still since they are become thy friends. And they would whiles lift in the abbot's lands when they had no merrier business on hand, and not seldom came to their above in their dealings with his men but all things come to an end for as i am told some year and a half ago the abbot had debate with the westland barons who both were and are ill men to deal with being both hungry and doughty the quarrel grew till my lord must needs defy them and to make a long tale short he himself in worldly armour led his host against them and they met some twenty miles to the west in the field of the rye bridge and there was holy church overthrown and the abbot who was as valiant a man as ever sang mass though not over wise in war would not flee and as none would slay him might they help it they had to lead him away and he sits to this day in their strongest castle the red mount west away well he being gone and many of his wisest warriors slain the rest ran into gates again but when the westlanders beset hyam and thought to have it good cheap the monks and their men warded it not so ill but that the westlanders broke their teeth over it forsooth they turned away thence and took most of the castles and strong-houses of the abbot's lands burned some and put garrisons into others and drave away a mighty spoil of chattels and men and women so that the lands of hyam are half ruined and thereby the monks though they be stout enough within their walls will not suffer their men to ride abroad whereby being cooped up in a narrow place and with no deeds to hand to cheer their hearts withal they are grown sour and churlish but brother said ralph howsoever churlish they may be and how so timorous i cannot see why they should shut their gates in our faces a little band when there is no foe near them 
Ralph, said you, thou must think of this once more, that the dry tree is no good let pass to flourish in honest men's faces, specialiter if they be monks. Amongst the brothers of Hyam the tale goes that those champions have made covenant with the devil to come to their above whensoever they be not more than one to five. Nay, moreover it is said that there be very devils amongst them, some in the likeness of Carl's and some, God help us, dressed up in women's flesh, and fair flesh also misseemeth. Also today they say in Hyam that no otherwise might they ever have overcome the stark and cruel Carl's of the burg of the four friths, and chased them out of their town, as we know they have done. Ha, what sayest thou? I say, Hugh, quoth Ralph angrily, that thou art a fool to go about with a budget of slanderous old wives' tales. Hugh laughed. Be not so wroth, little lord, for I shall be asking thee tales of marvels also. But hearken, I shall smooth out thy frowns with a smile when thou hast heard this. This folk are not only afeard of their old enemies, the devil-led men, but also they fear those whom the devil-led men have driven out of house and home, to wit, the burghers. Yet again they fear the burghers yet more, because they have beaten some of the very foes of Hyam, to wit, the Westland barons. For they have taken from them some of their strongholds, and are deemed to be gathering force. Ralph pondered a while, and then he said, Brother, hast thou any tidings of Upmeads? or that these burghers have gone down thither? God forbid, said Hugh. Nay, I have had no tidings of Upmead since I was fool enough to leave it. What, brother, said Ralph, thou hast not thriven then? I have had ups and downs, said Hugh, but the ups have been one rung of the latter, and the downs three, or more. Three months I sat in prison for getting me a broken head in a quarrel that concerned me not. Six months I was besieged in a town whither naught led me but ill luck. Two days I wore in running thence, having scaled the wall and swam the ditch in the night. Three months I served squire to a knight who gave me the business of watching his wife, of whom he was jealous, and to help me out of the weariness of his house, I must needs make love myself to the said wife, who, sooth to say, was perchance worth it. Thence again I went by night and cloud. Ten months I wore away at the edge of the wildwood, and sometimes in it, with a sort of fellows who taught me many things, but not how to keep my hands from other men's goods when I was hungry. There I was taken with some five others by certain sergeants of Hyam, whom the warriors of the town had sent out cautiously to see if they might catch a few men for their ranks. Well, they gave me the choice of the gallows tree or service for the church, and so my choice made— there have I been ever since, till I saw thy face this evening, fair sir. Well, brother, said Ralph, all that shall be amended, and thou shalt back to Upmeads with me. Yet wert thou to amend thyself somewhat, it might not be ill. Quoth Hugh, it shall be tried, brother, but may I ask thee somewhat? Said Ralph, ask on. Fair sir, said Hugh, Thou seemest grown into a pretty man when I saw thee e'en now before this twilight made us all alike. But the men at thy back are not wont to be led by men who have not earned a warrior's name. Yet they follow thee. How cometh that about? Again before the twilight gathered, I saw the woman that rideth Anias, who is now but a shadow. How fair and gentle she is. Indeed, there is no marvel in her following thee, though if she be an earl's daughter, she is a fair getting for an imp of upmeads. For thou art a well-shapen lad, little lord, and carriest a sweet tongue in thy mouth, but tell me, what is she? Brother, said Ralph kindly, she is my wife. I kiss her hand, said Hugh, but of what lineage is she? She is my wife, said Ralph, said Hugh, <laughs> that is forsooth a high dignity, said Ralph. Thou sayest sooth, though in mockery thou speakest, which is scarce kind to thine own mother's son, but learn, brother, that I am become a friend of the well, and were meet to wed with the daughters of the best of the kings. Yet is this one meeter to wed with me than the highest of the queens, for she also is a friend of the well. Moreover, thou sayest it, that the champions of the dry tree, who would think but little of an earl for a leader, are eager to follow me, and if thou still doubt what this may mean— Abide till in two days or three thou see me before the foeman, then shalt thou tell me how much changed I am from the stripling whom thou knewest in Upmeads a little while ago. Then was Hugh somewhat abashed, and he said, I crave thy pardon, brother, but
but never had I a well-filed tongue, and belike it hath grown no smoother amid the hard haps which have befallen me of late. Besides, it was dull in there, and I must needs try to win a little mirth out of kith and kin. So be it, lad, quoth Ralph kindly. Thou didst ask, and I told, and all is said. Yet forsooth, said Hugh, thou hast given me marvel for marvel, brother. Even so, said Ralph, and hereafter I will tell thee more when we sit safe by the wine at Upmeads. Now cometh back one of the four riders, and draweth rein by Ralph, and saith that they are hard on a little thorpe under the hanging of the hill that was the beginning of the down country on that road. So Ralph bade make stay there, and rest the night over, and seek new tidings on the morrow. And the man told Ralph that the folk of the thorpe were fleeing fast at the tidings of their company, and that it were best that he and some half-score should ride sharply into the thorpe, so that it might not be quite bare of victuals when they came to their night's lodging. Ralph bids him do so, but to heed well that he hurt no man, or let fire get into any house or roof. So he takes his knot of men and rides off on the spur, and Ralph and the main of them come on quietly. And when they came into the street of the thorpe, lo, there by the cross a big fire lighted, and the elders standing thereby cap in hand, and a score of stout carles with weapons in their hands. Then the chief man came up to Ralph and greeted him, and said, Lord, when we heard that an armed company was at hand, we deemed no less than that the riders of the burg were upon us, and deemed that there was naught for it but to flee each as far and as fast as he might. But now we have heard that thou art a good lord, seeking his own with the help of worthy champions, and a foeman to those devils of the burg. We bid thee look upon us and all we have as thine, lord, and take kindly such guesting as we may give thee. The old man's voice quavered a little as he looked on the stark shapes of the dry tree. But Ralph looked kindly on him, and said, Yea, master, we will but ask for a covering for our heads, and what victual thou mayst easily spare us in return for good silver, and thou shalt have our thanks withal. But who be these stout lads with staves and bucklers, or whither will they to-night? Thereat a tall young man, with a spear in his hand, and girt with a short sword, came forth and said boldly, Lord, we be a few who thought, when we heard that the burg devils were at hand, that we might as well die in the field giving stroke for stroke, as be hauled off and dropped to pieces under the hands of their tormentors. And now thou hast come, we have little will to abide behind, but were fain to follow thee, and do thee what good we can, and after thou hast come to thine above, when we go back to our kin, thou mayst give us a gift, if it please thee. But we deem that no great matter, if thou but give us leave to have the comfort of thee and thy champions for a while in these hard days. When he had done speaking, there rose up from the champions a hum as of praise, and Ralph was well pleased withal, deeming it a good omen. So he said, Fear not, good fellows, that I shall forget you when we have overcome the foemen, and meanwhile we will live and die together. But thou ancient man, show our sergeants where our riders shall lie to-night, and what they shall do with their horses. So the elders marshalled the little host to their abodes for that night, lodging the more part of them in a big barn on the western outskirt of the thorpe. The elder who led them thither brought them victual and good drink, and said to them, Lords, ye were best to keep a good watch to-night, because it is on this side that we may look for an onfall from the foemen, if they be abroad to-night, and sooth to say that is one cause we have bestowed you here, deeming that ye would not grudge us the solace of knowing that your valiant bodies were betwixt us and them, for we be a poor, unwalled people. Stephen, to whom he spake, laughed at his word, and said, Heart up, Carl! Within these few days we shall build up a better wall than ye may have of stone and lime, and that is the overthrow of our foemen in the open field. So there was kindness and good fellowship betwixt the thorpe dwellers and the riders, and the country folk told those others many tales of the evil deeds of the burg devils, as they called them, but they could not tell them for certain whether they had gone down into Upmeads. As to Ralph and Ursula, they, with Richard and Roger, were lodged in the headman's house, and had good feast there, and he also talked over the whereabouts of the burghers with the thorpe dwellers, but might have no certain tidings. So he and Ursula and his fellows went to bed and slept peacefully for the first hours of the night. End of chapter 21